thank God for the culture. Yeah. Fact. Yeah. Thank God for the culture. For him, man. Like you're saying hi to Christ. Hello, hi, hello, hi, hello, hi, hello. hello. Thank God for the culture. Amen. Jim. Thank God for the culture. Amen. All right, welcome back, folks, for two videos. The first about a Rawlsian liberal multiculturalism, and the second about a recognition based multiculturalism, which we'll see starts to move a little bit out of the orbit of liberalism, prefiguring many of the critiques of liberalism that we're going to see in the coming weeks. Okay, but this first video is about Will Kimlicka's liberal multiculturalism, a rights based multiculturalism. This means that Kimlicka's focus is on individual freedoms. Now, there are versions of multiculturalism which reject the idea of rights entirely. But Kimlicka does not. He wants to convince you that there are ways that we can enhance individual freedom by enhancing cultural freedoms. The two are not in conflict with each other. So we can do more than the standard package of equal rights that a Rawlsian liberal would want to extend. We can grant cultural freedoms of a sort that actually assist the individual. So he wants to get us beyond our usual ways of thinking of individual freedom as anti-traditional and in doing so, he argues that freedom for most of us really actually means making choices within our cultural traditions. And that brings us folks straight away to our hashtag puzzle for the week. Kimlicka says this on page 83. Freedom involves making choices among various options and our societal culture not only provides these options but also makes them meaningful for us. People make choices about the social practices around them based on their beliefs about the value of these practices, beliefs which I have noted may be wrong. And to have a belief about the value of a practice is, in the first instance, a matter of understanding the meanings attached to it by our culture. Okay, in order to understand this over the course of this lecture, we're gonna to need to look at Kimlicka's new theory of individual rights. And it really begins halfway through the book. It begins with some basic philosophical claims in chapter five, which then loop back to his other arguments. So Kimlicka thinks in his philosophy that he's doing two things different than earlier liberals had. He rejects the Lockean notion that we were all born individual choosers, that is capable of making and remaking our world simply by our own reason. And he thinks too, that he's rejecting Rawlsian claims based on impartial individual reason as well. He accepts a Rawlsian claim about self-respect, as we'll see, but he rejects the idea that fair decisions are necessarily blind to culture. So Kimlicka wants to rethink the individual human's relationship to her culture. He says that to be free as individuals, that is, to be able to make choices between options that have meaning for us, we need a secure cultural context, he calls it. The context is the backdrop of the cultural ideas that give meaning to the various options from which we might choose. The secure is a bit ambiguous and we're gonna get into that in the next video. So what's the cultural context? Well, for most of us, Kimlicka says, a life of freedom really means choosing from among a number of options that our culture has made meaningful for us. So let's imagine the options are to be a banker or a gangster a committed father or a deadbeat dad, a loyal citizen or a traitor. And notice that not all of these options are defined as good, but our culture will define what the options mean for us. Good or bad, we couldn't choose one of those options without knowing how the others in our culture will perceive of it. So there's a process of the construction of cultural meanings going on here which is not dissimilar from what was pointed to in structuralism. We'll get to some of the differences later. Like other liberals, Kimlicka says that we are free when we choose what is meaningful and good for us, but it is only within our cultural context that we learn what is good. Only within my culture that I learn, for instance, what it means to be a hero and not a coward. Indeed, even if we chose the option that our culture labels as bad, we do so 
only upon weighing what the choice will mean to ourselves and to others around us. In order to do anything that has meaning, in other words, there has to be somebody around us who understands the meaning of what we've done. And Kimlicka says that happens through our culture, especially the language that we speak. That is how we become comprehensible to others. For instance, you and I could argue over whether bankers or gangsters do more damage to Western society, but it wouldn't count as an argument within that dispute between us if I just said, you know what, I just, I just think gangsters are jaziznap. I've got to be using a language that makes my claims comprehensible to you. And even in order to do that, banker and gangster would already be predefined with the very meanings that we'd be arguing about. So like I said, you see an almost structuralist argument about language in Kimlicka, but he wants to say there's significant room for human agency within the languages that teach us our cultural meanings. In a sense, what he's saying is that we need to be a member of a cultural group before we can even be an individual chooser. And that gives us our first cut, but it's only our first cut at the meaning of our hashtag puzzle from page 83. Kimlicka had said, freedom involves making choices amongst various options, and our societal culture not only provides these options, but also makes them meaningful for us. Okay, but there's more to understand because there's a seeming paradox in his argument. Because he then goes on to say that in order to secure their cultural context, some groups can sort of condition the choices of their own members in certain small and defined ways, ways that will preserve the stability of their cultural matrix of meanings, as he calls it, thereby allowing the members of that culture to continue to enjoy the options that their culture makes meaningful for them. In essence, what he's saying is that for all the members of the culture to experience freedom choosing within those things, they may need the power to condition what some members think and do in order to preserve the stability that he's talking about. Okay, so then how does he make those claims and how do they link back to our hashtag puzzle? I'm gonna start out in chapter five, our indispensable reading, but I'm gonna wrap it around to the other chapters that are there in the suggested readings as well. Okay, so Kimlicka begins with a very basic question. Why is it even that liberals care to grant people freedom? What makes freedom good? He's trying to say that freedom must be linked to the human good in some way. It's gotta play some role in facilitating people in living lives that are good, but we know that people will actually go and make many mistakes about what's truly good in their own lives. So if that's the case, why not just bypass this whole freedom thing entirely and let governments tell us what's good? Well, Kimlicka's idea is that a true defense of freedom to answer this objection must link the human good to individual choice directly in some way, not just in a way that supposes that people will choose the good, because they evidently, you can see from society around you, often will not choose the good, but in a way that supposes that choice itself, whether it leads people right or wrong, is the good. To build a liberal conception we need, according to Kimlicka's view, an account of human autonomy as a primary moral good. Now, Kimlicka's conception of autonomy contains two basic principles, endorsement and revisability. So take a really close look at pages 80 to 84 of the assigned text. They're extremely important. I sometimes like to tell people that that chapter itself is maybe the best political theory written in the past 40 years. Those pages, 80 to 84, right at the core of them, are the core of that argument, the best quality of that argument. So let's start by thinking about the first endorsement. When confronted with that question that I just mentioned, if you're interested in the human good, why not just have governments tell us what's good? Well, our first instinct in response might be to say that, well, governments can't force someone to live up to some values because government may be corrupt or it may be just as prone to mistakes as we are and therefore governments don't know any more about the good than individual humans do. And that is a liberal thought. You'd find it in lots of liberal thinkers, but it forms really only part of a liberal answer to this question. Kimlicka wants to focus on another, what he thinks more important and more thoroughgoing liberal thought. 
even if a government knew what was good for us, we could not experience it as our own good unless we truly endorsed it as our own. And that bears repeating. Even if a government knew what was good for us, we could not experience it as our own good unless we truly endorsed it as our own. As Kim Lika himself would put it, lives go better by being lived from the inside by values we endorse. A life being lived following a bunch of external rules that we don't endorse as truly good just can't be good, even if it was according to good principles. We have to understand and accept the good inside in order to will it fully, he's saying. And notice also that this answer to this question about the power of governments also doesn't rely on any supposition that there are many valuable forms of life which you'll see supposed in some other liberal theories. He doesn't say, well, there are many valuable forms of life and that's why government can't pick one of them to enforce, even if there were only one good form of life. And even if the government knew for sure what it was, it would still be the case in Kimlicka's theory that for us to experience that life as our own good, we'd have to endorse it or live it from the inside. And Kim Lika says the way that we do that endorsement is by choice. But because we can get our values wrong, we can get our choices wrong, we need to be given the freedom also, not only to live our lives by values that we now endorse, but to actually change our values at any time. So Kim Lika calls this revisability, his second principle. To ensure that we can lead a life that is truly good for us, we need to be able not only to live our lives from the inside, but to revise our notions of what's good in light of new information or new experiences, searching for the best life, a life that is worthy of our continued allegiance. Now we could step aside from Kim Lika here for a second to critique his conception of autonomy by saying, well, maybe choice isn't the only way that we come to have values that we endorse. Choice, especially as an economist would think of it, involves having an array of options and picking the one that best fits our pre-existing preferences. But just as one important alternative, think of love as the way that we come to have values for our family or our spouses or our partners or our community. My wife, I think you could see, would be pretty insulted if I told her that I had come up with a list of the options available to me and I chose her simply because she best fit my pre-existing preferences. Oh, but it was close. There were some others that fit my preferences well also. No, to say that I love her is to say that she is the only one, not just the top of the list. If we choose the ones we'll love, it's only in a very loose sense of that word. Instead, maybe it's better to say that love necessitates our will. It's not that we will the thing we have chosen, but instead, that when we find ourselves in love, our will can't help but do anything else. But Kim Lika does think that his notion of cultural freedom can answer at least this objection, because Kim Lika doesn't make choice an abstract economic affair. And that gets us back again to our hashtag puzzle from page 83. Freedom involves making choices amongst various options, and our societal culture not only provides these options, but also makes them meaningful for us. We saw what that meant earlier. People make choices about the social practices around them based on their beliefs about the value of these practices, beliefs which I have noted may be wrong. So we just saw the principles of endorsement and revisability. And to have a belief about the value of a practice is, in the first instance, a matter of understanding the meanings attached to it by our culture. So as Kim Lika sees it, for most of us, a life of freedom really means choosing from among a number of options that our culture presents to us. In fact, for most of us, even individuality merely means being an idiosyncratic mix of culturally derived choices that we've made. So think about it this way. If I'm a university professor who likes NFL football and also big budget spy thriller movies, I roast a mean turkey on Thanksgiving Day and I give red roses on Valentine's Day. It's not that I'm the only person who does any of those things. I'm not a completely unique individual. Instead, I'm my own mix of the culturally available options. 
things that I do and things that I am, that's how I'm an individual. And I can tell you some of those options don't fit easily together, especially being a football fan and a college professor. As Kim Lucas says on pages 90 to 91, you'll see the quote here in front of you. The freedom which liberals demand for individuals is not primarily the freedom to go beyond one's language and history, but rather the freedom to move around within one's societal culture, to distance oneself from particular cultural roles, to choose which features of the culture are most worth developing and which are without value. So for Kinlicka, if the reason we even care about freedom is so that individuals can live lives from the values that they endorse and then revise those values when they wish, these individuals still need a culture. They need that culture in order to understand what values will have meaning for them in their lives, to choose which they'll endorse, and to know what their options would be for revision. Now let me tie that into the other chapters in his book. In Kimlicka's mind, people in the majority culture never have to worry that their culture might disintegrate and that the options that they find meaningful, their cultural matrix of meanings, as I've called it, will all of a sudden become unavailable to them. But he says, those in minority cultures may end up having an added worry that as some members of their culture choose to leave their culture to adopt the ways of the mainstream, then the option to practice traditional cultural ways of life may simply disappear for them. So these cultures, he says, can use some mechanisms to control not their own members, not the individuals internal to the group, but what the outside culture is doing to undermine them. So Kim Lucas says in chapter three in particular that there's a distinction between allowing a culture to use internal restrictions on the choices of its members and external protections. And he says that you'd allow these external protections to preserve what Rawls calls the social bases of self-respect. A culture, he says, may not use internal restrictions to quash dissent among the members of its own group, say when that dissent might lead to changes in the traditional cultural practices or customs which make up their matrix. But on the other hand, a culture can legitimately use external protections to provide protection against forces that are at work within the majority culture, which might tend to undermine a minority nation. So as Kim Lucas says, keeping cultures from being outvoted or outbid by the majority culture is a protection that we can grant them. Or in other words, political and economic power exercised by the majority, the votes and the bids of the majority. So those protections, he thinks, make the people within the culture free to choose. And he says that gives them the social bases of self-respect. So choosing within their cultural matrix of meaning is itself a basis of self-respect, but it's also the case that their self-respect is based on their knowledge that their protections against a majority that might denigrate them are strong. Now, in our next video, we're going to see two very powerful critiques of Kim Lucka. One that criticizes his idea that political power can be used to, quote, secure a cultural context, and another deeper one really that says that Kim Lucka simply misunderstands what's of value to humans to begin with. So I look forward to seeing you back at that video for those critiques. Bye now.